Let's face it, parenting is the most important job on earth. Every day presents a stack of different challenges, and more often than not, the answer is outside of the box. On this podcast, we will offer proven strategies, interview pioneers in education, give insights into how to be successful parents, and even share our imperfect experiences of being parents ourselves. We're all in on this journey, and we will span the globe to find out what is working and who has the answers. This is the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast. Here are your hosts, Darren McCarthy and Brian Powers. Welcome to the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast. I'm Brian Powers. And I'm Darren McCarthy. And Darren, today we are talking to Allison Morgan, founder and CEO of Zensational Kids. Yes. What a, what a, what a find we, we found in, in, in Allison yes. with her background in occupational therapy and sensory integration. And once again, uh, you know, a mom that's, uh, that's searching to find a way to, to, to make a difference, and she discovers a whole new methodology, right? Yeah, yoga, mindfulness for kids. Um, really, again, here we are back at the, you know, setting the foundation uh, for our children to, you know, to deal with the anxiety and stress that, um, unfortunately, is in their life. Yeah, we're seeing it time and time again. She, she really tapped into the importance of having that inner calm. And, that, and what I really liked was that she was talking about not only the importance for the kids, but the importance for the teachers. Because if they're not calm, they're, they're, they're going to project a certain energy that's not going to allow the children to be calm and, and be kind of in an accepting environment. Correct. And then we both, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I mean, it made sense when she said it, but I don't, I don't think about it. I mean, I know for a fact, I tell myself all the time I could never do that job, but to look at the anxiety and stress that it brings and, and something we didn't talk about, but it dawned on me too, is like a lot of the teachers have kids, you know, in that, you know, elementary to middle school age group. So it's, you know, they're, they're helping uh, to teach our kids and then going home and, and deal with the same stressors that we are. I remember, I remember when I did my student teaching, I did a student teaching in kindergarten. Yeah. And then I, re- I remember going home and thinking to myself, what would it be like if I had a little <laughs> kindergartner at home after this whole day? And, and I think she's tapped, she's tapped into a really important piece here that like one of the things we never, we don't realize is that there's so much burden carried by teachers and, and there's so much that just kind of keeps getting added and nothing ever gets taken away. So it's more pressure, it's more, you know, curriculum, it's more, you know, uh, methodology, uh, a greater, broader stroke, and and nothing, you know, it's not like, okay, we're going to give you more time to work on uh, centeredness and give these these children a a place uh, to find their calm. But it sounds like Jersey's been pretty, pretty acceptant to, you know, of what she's doing. What do you think? Yes. Yeah, a lot of, she's developed a lot of programs, trainings. Um, you know, even on our site, a lot of free tools that, um, you know, applicable to anyone, not just teachers, uh, but I like the fact that she's going after and, and uh, helping kids, you know, kind of at that, that core, uh, to deal with, you know, the anxiety and stresses before they take on the schoolwork or stopping in the middle of the day and let's take 10 minutes to center ourselves uh, and use some mindfulness so that we're ready to go on to the next, the next thing. And it, and it, you know, unfortunately I feel like, you know, just like in the working world, they push, 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 push with these kids and don't give them a chance to, um, you know, center themselves and bring themselves back to um, kind of square one with, and, and utilizing the, the skills of mindfulness and, and, and yoga as well. Breathing she talked about too. Yeah, well, and it's, it's we we often we've been using that term self-regulation a lot lately. But you you can't regulate your system until you center your system and find a, a you got to be present. Correct. So we always you know we're always talking about par- parents being present and so on and so forth. But it starts with that piece, and then you can start to regulate and get your systems kind of in in, in tune. Um, and it makes a lot of sense what she's doing. I think. 
we can just jump right in with, with where she was going with us. And we, we learned so much in, in this in this conversation. And she even gave us a little practical strategy where she was talking about the, the, the breathing rocket ship. Yeah. And she drew that whole visual for us. So, you know, I think parents are really going to get into this one. Yeah, a lot of good tips and and, and tools uh, and information from Allison Morgan of Sensational Kids. Here we go. Welcome, Allison Morgan. Glad to have you on on the podcast today. Uh, tell us, you know, a little bit about yourself and and kind of your background in in uh, Sensational Kids. Sure. Well, thank you so much for for having me. I'm so excited to share with your your audience. Um, so I've been in education for over 25 years. Uh, I started as a pediatric occupational therapist, working with our most challenging students in the school. And about 15 years ago, I happened to find just yoga and mindfulness in my own life, not thinking, oh, this would be great to incorporate into what I do in school, but more just as my own exploration. And it was through this practice of my own that I just started to see the connection between these really simple things that I was doing was creating internal change within me. Sure. And the change that I was finding was just that I was definitely calmer, even though I was already a very calm person, but I was able to carry that calmness throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, even when I came back home after work, because at that time my children were very young, sure. I was also really, really clear you know, so I could be in a situation in school that could be really stressful or emotionally challenging and just breathe through it and really make the best decision in that moment of what to do. You know, I was really just starting to see how it was these practices that were creating some, some change within me that was really adding to my life experience and my work experience. And what I really, really took from those practices was I was creating a different internal state than I typically had. And it was making me more functional in my day and happier in my day. And I thought, my gosh, like all the students that I see all day long, I don't think that they ever feel this way within themselves, feel, feel safe, feel calm, feel in control, feel focused. Um, and I knew through all the work that I was doing, which was about like changing neurology and changing physiology, I knew other things to do, but nothing made more sense to me than what I was doing in my own body. And I just asked this overriding question of, can we teach these things to kids? Yeah. Like, why, why, why not? Like, I don't need all this equipment that I was using in therapy. Right. Um, you know, kids could do this at their seats or <laughs> right next to their chairs. So, like, what if we taught this to our students? But this is 15 years ago. I mean, nobody was doing this. <laughs> right, right, ago. right, right. Yeah, they, looked at, they looked at you, I'm sure, like you had six heads. <laughs> ten. Ten <Yeah>. heads. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was really fortunate that I had this wonderful OT career. I was very respected in, in the school. Everybody trusted me. I mean, essentially what I just started doing was like I was making things up. I was doing things in classes like, you know, that I was learning and trying to translate that to, um, you know, a kindergartner that was autistic and nonverbal. You know, <laughs> how can I make that transition? Yeah, right. Um, but I was able to do it. And what I was finding was, I mean, to me, it was like miraculous. I really just, I could not believe that by teaching children how to utilize their breath, they could calm themselves down or how to teach them how to focus on just simple movements, like simple up and down movements of using their breath, how that would help them like focus their attention. You know, 15 years ago, we really didn't have the research behind what was happening within human physiology and neurology when we're doing these things. We actually have the science to back it now. Sure. For me as an OT, I come from a clinical background. I'm used to try something, observe it, and that's your evidence. So sure. I was... I was really cool with that. I was great with that. I was so pleased with what I was seeing that 
and teachers were noticing the change and they just started asking me to come in and do more in their classrooms because all of us that are educators know that over let's even just say the last 10 years right. the amount of students in a classroom that need help and now i don't mean that they need occupational physical therapy or speech therapy but they're they're suffering emotionally socially we have many many more kids with mental health issues right now that just let's just say stress and anxiety that are causing a lot of challenges in classrooms for both the teacher and the students. So more and more teachers started asking me to just, can you come in and help me out a little bit, like sure. something. Um, but I'm also a realist being in schools. I can't go in there and work with a whole class for a half hour when they ha were supposed to be working on math, <laughs> right. right? So I had to do something like what's quick, what's i used to call it that this is going to be like a big bang for the buck and i mean transformative in the shortest amount of time um mm -hmm. that's what i knew i had to deliver in order for them to keep asking me to come back and for it to be practical in schools sure. so i started developing these um these tools these techniques that were literally just that the biggest bang for the buck and it got to a point where you know, I'm still the school OT. I'm in this one district. I'm like, this is ridiculous. This cannot just be me doing this. Like every kid needs to know how to do this. Every teacher needs to know how to do this. But uh -huh. that was really the impetus to forming Sensational Kids and leaving my role as an OT and essentially become an entrepreneur, uh, you know, start this company where even when I started Sensational Kids, you know, I, I started it eight years ago. Schools were not knocking down my door. Like, oh, this is great. Like, come and teach <laughs> mindfulness. Um, you know, people were still like, you're a successful OT. Like, why are you doing this? Well, and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting as you say that, because I, I just went to an IEP last week. Uh -huh. There was a real strong push for the child to get OT. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was sitting back, you know, having the background and kind of understanding sensory integration a, a, little, a little bit, not as much as you, obviously, mm -hmm. but the, the concept of the child getting what 20 minutes of o, what's called OT, but it's really working on handwriting, where the schools are and where you are is a complete and utter <laughs> shit. I mean, it's on the other side of, of I don't oh. even know how to explain it. <laughs> oh, well, I could, I could explain it in a couple of ways. What most th school-based therapists um, have to work on because of the environment and the expectation is skill building. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason kids can't do those skills is because of the wire, the, their neur neurological wiring and their physiological lack of balance. Yep. And even while I was an OT, while I was using these tools, what started to happen in my OT sessions were I wouldn't work on any of those functional skills. In, even in my individual sessions, it would purely be like yoga and mindfulness-based. Mm -hmm. And then the last five or 10 minutes, I would just look at the performance of those skills and there was improvement sure. because I would align the body and the mind and you're able to do so much more when that's aligned. But we're, we're not even um, looking at what's the basis, what's the foundational basis of us being well and doing well. We're totally negating that. Yeah, well, you know, it's, I, I had a, I met with a chiro, my, my chiropractor is a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. and he and I sat down and he and he says he goes, um, what are you doing to de-stress? And there was a long pause. Mm -hmm. and the answer was ultimately nothing, mm -hmm. right? And so, so what you're talking about is is not just doing something, but doing the right thing. Yes. And, and, and there's a big, I mean, uh, I think it's a difference. shift, you know, to get, to get kids started in doing something. I, th I don't think that's a bad thing. Right. And I, I think that's kind of a precursor to um, going all in. But I, can you give us an idea of, of um, kind of what, what they would, what a parent would see in their child that would make them kind of want to start doing some of the exercises you're talking about, some pragmatic kind of stuff. 
I'm so sorry. Did you That's get it, right? <laughs> like, oh, that was a really good question. <laughs> that was a really good question. Are I'm you? So sorry. Are you on a phone? Are you on your phone? No, I'm on my computer, and I've been having all these computer issues. Whatever. I unplugged it. I moved my computer. I came back here for this interview to be in my office, and I forgot when to plug it back in. Ah. So of course, my being hooked up. No oh, worries. Yeah. That's so, the best of us. <laughs> I tell Darren all the time: podcasting <laughs> is not overproduced radio. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's. It's, it's the real happen. deal. <laughs> yeah. Real life. It's like, and you know what? Here's the thing. Educators could totally appreciate that. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, life is what happens while you're making the other plans. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it just is. There's no such thing as perfect. Like, it's not only about knowing what to do. You're talking about your own self-care. And right. you said it's okay. not only about, you know, knowing what to do, say part of your self-care, but it's also how to do something that's effective. And Correct. you were about to ask me, so can you give uh, the, the... Yeah, can you? <laughs> yes. I think you were asking to give our, our listeners some, some actionable items. That they... Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Wasn't that pretty exactly impressive right. that I was able to rewind all that? <laughs> That's because you are Zen. <laughs> Perhaps. Ryan, are you re are you recording again? Or are you going to stop and start? No, I, we're still. This is all rolling. We're still rolling. rolling. We're not from there. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Let's keep it going. Yes. <laughs> all right. So, um, although starting is very important, um, going in the right direction where you can actually make a difference will will help you do things that will last. It's yeah. why we exercise, right? It's it's why. It's, you know, we don't exercise for six months and then not lose weight or getting fit and keep going on the program. Yeah. So what we were going to, what I was going to ask you is, is what, you know, a couple of different things. One is um, when you, can you describe kind of like the perfect student or the ideal kind of candidate for your program? It's anybody. And, the, it, anybody. There, there really is no like this candidate's better than this. And that's one of the things that makes it such a powerful thing in a classroom is because it really is for everybody. And um, it, here's the other thing that why it's unlike anything else that schools bring in to help with all the issues that we're seeing. And we could even just like list the issues that they're seeing. But typically when schools implement a new program or an initiative, it's all about what can we do for the students, mm -hmm. right? What can we teach the students? So let's look at mindfulness as, as what, could we what, what are we teaching the students? We're helping them to become more self-aware. We're helping them to manage their stress. We're helping them to regulate their emotions. We're helping them to become more focused, more compassionate, more resilient. You know, and, and the list goes on of what the research is showing mm -hmm. that these practices bring. But here's, here's the biggest thing about mindfulness of why it's so powerful, is that it's not just for the students, it's for the teachers as well. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's in education or reading any of the research about education right now, teachers are suffering just as much as students are. There's a statistic out of the National um, Teachers Federation, 78% of teachers are physically and emotionally exhausted. The amount of stress that teachers are under right now is compared to the amount of stretch, stress as an emergency room physician right now, because there are many teachers that are performing triage in their in their classrooms i mean it's just unbelievable and part of that goes into play with the amount of students that we have in our classrooms now that are suffering from mental health issues and the amount of students that we have in classrooms right now that have experienced developmental trauma so they have experienced trauma throughout their throughout their life due to um, living conditions family conditions it's not necessarily a traumatic event but it's just they are living with adversity. And this brings lots of behaviors and lots of challenges into classrooms that teachers now, on top of all this testing, on top of all this curriculum, have to manage all of this. And it, it is sort of like above and beyond. The, I don't know the how they, 
I don't know how the expectation is there that they can manage that. It, it, exactly. Exactly. It's so unrealistic. But, yeah. So teachers really need tools themselves to, to manage this level of stress, to manage this level of, of anxiety and overwhelm and being burnt out. They, like schools need to do something about that because here's the thing. When teachers are overwhelmed, stressed out, anxious, burnt out, they are not in, I'm going to continue using this, uh, the neurological or the physiological state that prepares them to be able to lead a classroom. They're not ready to teach in a classroom because the number one thing about teaching is about connection, about humanly connecting and being present for people, for an individual, for another human being, and they're not prepared for that. So students are not connecting to them on that level. And if they can't connect, they can't learn. And the teacher is also the main, um, you could say sets the main emotional state in a classroom. So sometimes teachers are setting off their students. Yeah. yeah. They're creating the stress in the classroom. So there's no way that we are going to be able to help students with all of the, you know, the issues of mental health and trauma and all of that, unless we help the teacher as well. And there's nothing else that we're bringing into schools that is able to address this like mindfulness. Wow, there's nothing else. Great. It's, you know, just what you said there, and I, I was gonna say, the students almost sense that because I can oh, only talk so from my much, own experience. Brian, there is so much of our communication between human beings that it's absolutely nonverbal. It is a felt sense. It's communicating through the body. It's that nonverbal, the body language, the facial expression. That's really how we communicate first as human beings. The speech part is actually after. And think about how many times you're in a conversation with someone and they're saying one thing and you know, you know they mean something else or they believe something else. Yeah. The way you know that is because their body can't hide it. Yeah. <laughs> just like a teacher can't hide it when they just got reamed out by a parent or by their principal or they know that they have too much work that they have to get done that they can't and they're totally stressed out and they walk into the classroom with a big smile on their face. <laughs> Kids All right, see right through that. Yeah. No, they, they still, they're still bringing that stress state right. of being into the classroom. You can't, and you can't expect them to just like, oh, I'm a professional. Let me just like brush it off. Yeah. Okay. Well, and it's, you know, we, we were taught, you know, through my, through my education back, you know, background that you have to be calm in order to learn. Right. And you That's have to be in that kind of state. And it's, right. you know, we, you brought up something interesting earlier. It was like, it reminds me of how I had to explain acupuncture was working out for me. Hmm. Right. It was one of these things that everybody said, do, you know, give it a shot. And I gave it a shot and I hate needles and so on and so forth. And, and then they'd ask me, well, how's it going? And then you have to explain like the, the, how it feels. And, and, and really the only way I could explain is that it, it creates a calm from within. Absolutely. And exactly what you're talking about here is, is giving the, the child, the, first of all, the teacher, and then the child kind of this state of calm from within it becomes now teaching and, and all of the quantifiable stuff that all the districts are looking for can take place because they're in a state of calm and they're out of that, that, that hyper arousal. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you a question on the, um, on creating the program itself. Mm -hmm. It sounds like um, it's, I mean, you have the OT background, mm -hmm. right? And so you have a sensory OT background, it, it sounds like. And yeah, then, I'm, cert I'm certified in sensory. Well, okay. Training. And so you started to develop some of these other, did you take some things from like brain gym and different programs and kind of pull them all together? And um, Well, I have to say yes to that because there are things in here that are from um, like based in yoga, like breathing practices and postures and things like that. 
Um, so there's definitely things that were integrated from other types of disciplines. And yes, even brain gym, there are things in brain gym that really do help connect right and left hemisphere of the brain. And I did put that in the program and cite brain gym as this particular exercise oh. is from brain gym. I mean, everything's, everything's cited um, if it was borrowed from another, another source. Uh -huh. um, the things that I did that are more creatively me is, um, especially with breathing practices, there are certain ways that we can use our breath that help calm down our system and certain th ways that we breathe that can balance our system or energize our system. So it's about patterns of breath. And then I created them in like fun ways with fun names. Mm -hmm. um, that are um, engaging to students. Like for example, there's one breath, it's called rocket breath. So the kids use their hands as a launch pad and the, and the, and the rocket. And we inhale through our nose and we lift up our rocket up to the sky and then really slowly we exhale to have it land calmly on the, on the launch pad again. So we're breathing in and out through our nose, but it's a quick inhale and then a very slow exhale. And that pattern of breathing actually activates what's called our parasympathetic nervous system, which it's part of our autonomic nervous system. So autonomic um, nervous system are things that happen automatically. We don't have to think about them. We have a sympathetic nervous system is like our stress response. The parasympathetic nervous system is our relaxation response. Right. But we could use our breath in the pattern of how we breathe to actually turn that branch of our autonomic nervous system on. Brilliant. I love the visual and the kinesthetic piece pulled together. Uh, yeah. I mean, and then we do some other things like that particular breath. We'll also use it to help get, a, get rid of a worry. Because sometimes kids just, they come in with a worry. I'm worried about my dog. I'm worried about my mother. I'm worried. So they could put their worry in the rocket. So we're acknowledging what the worry is. We're not trying to push it away. It's like, here, I have a worry. But we're just going to send the worry up into outer space. It could, it could, we, we don't need it right now. So we do that other sort of like as a little mindfulness practice. But while we're letting the worry go, we're also calming down our nervous system. What kind of, what kind of response have you had from the, from the kids? Oh my gosh, Darren, it's, <laughs> I, I, I have to tell you, it is, every time I go into a classroom, because part of the program that we offer schools is that we give them support in the classroom so we can really help them integrate this. And I would say, um, there, there, there are a couple of categories. One thing is that we're also teaching kids about how their brain works and we're normalizing um, certain things about our brain. One of them being that we have lots of thoughts and the other that they're often negative thoughts. That's human nature. It's how we're built. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that students comment on is because we, we have reflection and discussion about it. And they sort of like look around the room and they're like, all of you had a lot of thoughts during that practice like everybody you everybody did and everybody's like yep i did i had a lot of thoughts because there are some kids suffering in their thoughts they think that i mean this this particular situation i had a third grader say to me like i actually said to the whole class i thought i was crazy i thought i was going crazy because my mind always has a lot of thoughts Right. And, and yeah, they're I not mean, articulating that piece and it's not a, it's not a we're calm not inner side. About right? it. Uh -huh. We're not talking about it. That like everybody, everybody has this voice in their head that talks to them all the time. But here through these practices, we have a way to look at these thoughts, actually slow them down and become the master of those thoughts rather than the robot that responds or reacts to the thoughts. Big, big difference, like total game, game changer. Yeah, well, I mean, what a great thing to integrate into like a writing piece or, or some kind of, do, they, uh, do the schools doing that? Are they doing that kind yeah, of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, with the tools that we teach um, 
educators, we also share with them like the best time to offer certain things based on what you're teaching. So for example, in our elementary school curriculum, we teach them calming strategies. We also teach them strategies that are energizing because sometimes kids are, they're tired enough, like you want to pick them up. Um, but we also have things that are focusing that really help clear the mind and focus the attention. And so there are certain things that I'm like, you know, before you teach a new math concept, get them focused, get them calm and get them focused mm -hmm. first. Well, that's, it's interesting because that's how that's exactly how we used to implement the music. So the music, you know, through assimilation with the rhythm and so on and so forth, um, that that's kind of how you create the environment, so to speak. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I think that ties in perfectly. Now, yeah. Kind of. So from a parent's perspective, you know, let's just take an example of like homework. Mm -hmm. You know, coming off the bus at two thirty, three o'clock, and don't, you know, I have an eight year, eight and a six year old, and they don't want to go near it. You know, and then to try and sit down, and and I feel like you could some of that calming, those calming exercises could be helpful. Maybe we could, you know, give a give some parents some tips on, you know, how to bring them back to center, so so to say. Yeah. Well, well, let me just say a couple of things just about homework from a parent's perspective as well <laughs> <laughs> having been through that knowing what it's like to have your kids come off the bus and have to do their homework so they can rush to another activity yep. mm. um sometimes kids like they need a break like they they need like a marker of like this is this is my break this is my transition between school and homework. So I, I think as parents, we need to acknowledge that and help kids decide what that break is going to be. Because sometimes what happens is they get off the bus, they get home and like you, like you want them to hurry up and get it done. And it's like you spend all this time procrastinating getting it done. And that procrastination, really, it's, it's trying to fill that gap of a transition, but it's with very little intention. So if we could help kids recognize like they need, they, they need some type of break. And some of the, the break could actually be a practice or two, which I could, sh I could share some practices with, with you to do that. That's, um, the perfect, that's the perfect explanation to a school of why they need your program. Uh, yeah, I mean, the exact same scenario, you know, if you yeah, just yeah, take a few yeah, minutes yeah. to do this now, you're not going to push it all out through the whole afternoon. Yeah, right? it, it, exactly. Like we can't be on go all the time. Like really part of, part of learning is the synthesizing and like letting it just be within our mind and body and integrate. And the integration part sometimes needs to just be like stillness. Like literally let my mind and the cells of my body just capture what all, what all of that was. But in our society, we're always about like the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And I got to tell you, this doesn't help no. because this is always about the next bit of information. We are information junkies. Yeah. All of us. Correct. Yeah. All of us. And we expect, you know, Look, we talk about the teachers and even adults, working adults, we push ourselves, go, go, go constantly. And that usually leads to burnout and stress and anxiety. But then what do we do? And I'm a victim. I'm the, per you know, I'm guilty of it as well. We push our kids on the same side. It's school, homework, baseball. Trust me, activities. everything we're seeing is all our fault. Of course. It, it is. <laughs> um, but the other thing that I wanted to add about, you know, being the parent and your child coming home and how to best help them, um, what, what my youngest daughter taught me so well is that my, my stress and my anxiety over whether or not my child is going to do their homework, finish their homework, do it correctly, like do it well, me having that stress and then sitting by them, being by them or hovering over them while they're doing their homework is so counterproductive for them. It, it's awful. I mean, I, my daughter, so my youngest daughter actually had 
some challenges in school, like learning. Th thing, things were very hard for her in the beginning. So I used to want to sit down with her with her homework and go through it with her and help her. And here, I'm an OT. Like, this is what I do. <laughs> and at one point, like I sat down with her, you know, that stressed mom, but with a smile, like, of like, course. we're going to yeah. do this, you know, and she would look over at me. She's like, what's the matter? I'm like, nothing. Like, let's just do this. We'll do this together. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd go to, she'd go to do it. And finally she went, you know what? You just can't be next to me while wow. you're, you're doing, you're stressing me out. Uh -huh. and, really what it was i mean i think she was like in second grade when this happened but what was so clear to me was of course she's stressed because i am so stressed sure. about whether or not she's going to be able to do this and whether or not i'm going to help her yeah, so that's a, that's yes an important piece um you it seen you have a you just had a trade show correct or well, it wasn't a, a, you're talking about the trauma sensitive schools? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah so that? this was an unbelievable, unbelievable conference. It was the third year that they've done this conference. It's put together by what's called the Attachment Network, and it's called Creating Trauma Sensitive Schools. It's one of the biggest um, trauma informed conferences in the country. Mm -hmm. um, they had 1,800 educators from around the world there attending wow. attending the conference which shows you number one how much more informed we are about trauma in this country and the world and number two how much we all need to learn because it is affecting every single community it does not matter your zip code there is trauma in every developmental trauma in every single zip code um, so for the, this conference this is the second year that I went to this conference as an exhibitor. So we had a table um, and a presenter. So I presented last year and I presented um, a breakout session this year as well. And it truly is unbelievable just to speak to the participants that come to learn and to you know pop into some of the breakout sessions because they just have incredible speakers. So what was the crux of your of your uh, conversation or your speech? So my um, my breakout session was titled "Bringing the Self Back into Regulation," hmm. and it really is was about how for both educators and students, how can we truly utilize these tools of mindfulness to have these tools of regulation within us so that we can do this ourselves. Mm -hmm. wow, wow. right? Because self-regulation really is about self being one, the one, regulate, mm -hmm. bringing ourselves back into balance. How do we bring ourselves back into balance? And the truth is these tools of breath, movement, and mindfulness that we share through Sensational Kids, they neurologically and physiologically do just that. They bring the nervous system back into balance. You don't need a squishy ball. You don't need a special chair. You don't need a spinny thing. You don't need spinners. You need, you need your breath and you need to know how to use it. You need your body and you need to know the power of your body, of how you position yourself in different ways actually aligns your nervous system. And really? mindfulness, how to focus your attention. Are you, are you getting that students, some, some, some of these children have never felt these this feeling before yes huh. yeah. yeah yeah like the first time is it through a session with you some of these teachers never have either mm. which is really you know we we run a lot of um educator self-care sessions um and i used to try to get schools to do this long ago because you can't give what you don't have right mm -hmm. um but it's only within the last i would say year year and a half that schools are calling me more and more for this it's uh -huh. really needed i, I mean I'll, I'll tell you i had a school um call me realizing that they really need to do this because they had a teacher commit suicide oh. in school mm -hmm. Wow. I, I mean, 
Yeah, it's it's like you said. I mean, you know, I was I taught a long time ago, but yeah. you know, I, I was twenty two year old kid that had shingles. Oh you wow! Know, and it, you know, and it's yeah. it's it. I don't think people realize that when you uh, you say you've got nowhere else to go with the emotion, that oh, there no. is that there is trauma. You know, from oh. that whole experience, and you know, the oh. average teacher only lasts a couple of years. Yeah. And, and so this is great that they yes. have all these, you know, all these things to go to. I'm, I'm, and, it's, and I commend, you know, the Jersey school systems for, for accepting it and, you know, allowing you to do what you do yeah. without, you know, handcuffs or anything like this, you know, just to get in there and do what you got to do. Yeah. Great. Come on yeah. into New York. We're ready. <laughs> well, we are, I mean, we are. We, you know, we do work with school. It's just that we're based in New Jersey, so it's a bit easier Mm -hmm. um, for schools to work with us over time. Sure. Um, and when I say that is that, um, you know, schools are used to having a yearly initiative. Yes. And I tell schools, you're not getting this done in a year. Like, <laughs> because they're, they're not, because I'm not talking about just teaching you what to do with your kids. I'm teaching you about a different way of being within yourself as the educator, the administrator, the student, and the parents. So this is not an overnight transformation. I want to help schools change the climate and the culture of the school and for this to be a lifetime change of how we are together and individually with a much more kind, compassionate, and um, self-aware way of being. So. For the schools in New Jersey, what I do is I, I set up open trainings where any school can send any amount of teachers um, throughout the year. So what schools will do, or what I really recommend that they do is send me five to 10 teachers at a time. So we'll train them one month, that month we'll go into their classroom, we'll help support them. Next month, send me another group, mm -hmm. then send me another group, rather than like bang, like let's get everybody done. Um, because the other reality is that not every this is not every teacher is gonna buy in in the first year mm -hmm. because some teachers it's like okay something else you want me to do something else are you yes. kidding me right. yeah. like, I mean literally we'll have some teachers that be like this is just another initiative honey I'm just gonna wait till next year because it'll be gone mm -hmm. I mean, that is the mentality. And I don't blame them because that's typically how schools have functioned over the years. Well, and, and from a teacher's perspective, you don't want to get too excited about something that is going to, you know, go away. You know, right. It, but it, if a teacher is excited about this, you own this. Awesome. Because it becomes Great. your own pra practice. So sure. it, never, it never goes away if you're invested in it. Mm -hmm. Our focus in Sensational Kids is to grow that that investment, that buy-in, that interest over a couple of years. Because what happens is that those teachers that were the naysayers in the beginning, you don't need to push them. You don't need to tell them they have to do this and mandate it because they're going to see the change that happens in the classrooms and with the educators that were the early adopters. So what happens is they end up asking. You know that training that you sent those people to last year, like, can I, can I go this year? That's so the ideal, right? It's, it is the ideal. I mean, that is what I tell every single school. Like, do not make this a mandate. Do not make this initiative. Do not tell teachers that they have to go. Ask who wants to go, because this is for them. It's mm -hmm. not just about what you're learning for the, for the kids. So they should want to go. Sure. So I assume you have a, you have a website and you have some yeah. trainings and yeah. So the website's um, www.zensationalkids.com. So like sensational, but it's zen. <laughs> you know? um, and on the website, on the homepage, we actually have a free ebook. So if people want to um, sign up and download that right. that ebook, and in that ebook you get um, scripted practices that explain you know, what to do and how to do it and some illustrations that you could share with, with uh, your children at home or students. So that's- right. um, Yeah, I'm on here now and you definitely, yeah, the programs, um, it's very robust and, and then you have a couple of free uh, tools as well for students and teachers and then um, a couple of resources on mindfulness that you know, parents could definitely access. Yeah.
Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely, when we'll, those will all be in the show notes as always. Um, you know, if, if folks are, are unable to, to write as they're listening, um, you know, the, the resources will definitely be there in the notes and, uh, and we'll be happy to share if after, after this, you find some, some stuff that you think would be appropriate for us to share, uh, as well in the notes, please, by all means. Yeah. Great, great. stuff. Yeah. yeah. I think this is a, is a great first conversation. Yeah. I was going to say, this is not the last conversation. <laughs> I picture myself jumping on the, uh, jumping on the turnpike and heading down to New Jersey. <laughs> We're going to have a further conversation about my, you know, my I, own. I would love style. to. I, anytime. It's really great, fun great being stuff. with you guys. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you so well, much. Allison Morgan. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, sensational kids. And we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thanks so great. much. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast with your hosts, Darren and Brian. Find them on social media at Sound Foundations for Parenting. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And we'll catch you next time on the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast.